How are we feeling, Fresh Life? I hope you are excited. I believe that God does not do accidents. You are not tuned into this service by accident, whether you're in a building, a boat, a gym, an office, a dorm room, a car, a bike, a hike, wherever you're at. I believe God is going to speak to you today. I believe it with all my heart. I've been praying for you this week, and I just, I'm so excited to be here. Fresh Life, I love you as a church. I, I feel like family, and I just got to say before I get started, Pastor Levi and Pastor Jenny, man, we love you. Me and Jill love you so much. We, we cherish our friendship, and we're so grateful for you guys, and thanks for letting us come hang out this weekend. We love you guys. Go ahead and take your seats. If you... Uh, If you have ever dealt with anxiety or depression or care about somebody who has, today is for you. I'm telling you. The CDC right now says that over, you can go to the website right now, over 50% of all Americans will deal with a mental illness in their lifetime. And anxiety and depression are topping the charts. What that tells me and what that tells you is almost every single one of us tuned into this talk right now, we've either dealt with this stuff personally or we care about somebody who has. It's that prevalent. But I do not believe that's God's plan for our life. I do not believe we have to just sit back and take it. I don't believe, I used to, but I don't believe anymore that we have to just sit back and deal with depression and be attacked by anxiety. But I believe through the spiritual weapons that God has given us through the powerful name of Jesus and his Holy Spirit, we can take a stand, we can push back, we can say, I'm not gonna just be attacked, I'm gonna attack back and I'm gonna start to experience some peace and some joy and some freedom that Jesus died to provide us with, amen? Here's where we're headed. I want this to start to build your faith. I know there's a whole bunch of you tuning into this right now, and this is very personal for you. And, and I understand that because it's very personal for me. Um, and I, what I know is, is when we're dealing with anxiety and depression at high levels, one of the first things that goes is hope. Wow. And we start to feel like, we start to believe this lie that says, you're always gonna be that way. It's just your lot in life. You're never gonna be able to change. Your loved one's never going to be able to change. It's just who you are. It's just who they are. We're just stuck. And I just don't believe that's the, that's the case. And I want you to start to get something already on the inside of you today that goes, I'm going to believe my God for more. Amen? Amen. Listen to this. May the God of hope, and I love this, may the God of hope, because like I said, hopelessness is one of the things that we start to experience first when anxiety gets bad. God says, that's not what I have for you. I have different for you. I have more for you. I am the God of hope. And I want to fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. Notice that's the opposite of anxiety. That's the opposite of depression. The God of hope will fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. He says, I don't want you to just get by anymore. I don't want you to just make it through your day. I don't want you to just eke through life. I want you to be overflowing with peace and joy and hope, not only so it changes your life, but so that your life change starts to leak on everybody around you and it begins to change people's lives everywhere you go. He says, I got more in store for you. Let's pray and we'll get started. God, I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you that you've brought us together as family and friends from literally around the world right now. And God, I pray that you would speak in a powerful way. I pray that you would, you would fill our spirits with a newfound faith today, a new expectation of what could be through you. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. amen. Well, hey, so um, about, uh, I, I, I wish this wasn't the case. Um, but I, I am talking to you today out of my book called Attacking Anxiety, and it, it comes from personal experience. And I wish that wasn't the case, but it is. Um, in 2019, um, and, and Levi and Jenny know all about this because we were talking all the time when this was going on, but in 2019, I almost lost everything to anxiety. Um, I had been dealing with anxiety and depression for many years. Uh, the problem was, is I was hiding it. And I was hiding it, and some of you are going to know what I mean by this. I was hiding it, well, for many reasons. I was embarrassed. I felt shame. I felt weak. But one of the things that had me hiding my anxiety is I'm a part of a church. And I have this, I have this like pressure, and I don't know where it came from. I think it's, you know, we, we read verses like what we just read, that, that God is a God of peace and joy and hope. And what I know about myself 
is I don't have those things. I don't have peace and I don't have joy and I don't feel hopeful and I have anxiety and I have depression and I feel stuck. And so maybe, maybe I'm a hypocrite. Like maybe I shouldn't be even plugged into a church. Maybe, I, maybe I'm a second class Christian. Maybe I don't have the right kind of faith because if I had the right kind of faith, I wouldn't be broken like this. And, and for me, it was maybe I shouldn't be a pastor. And it's true, isn't it? Sometimes we fall into this trap of we come to church and it's the place where we feel like we have to get most dressed up for. Right, right. And you know, it's supposed to be the opposite fresh life. Yes. This is not the place we come and hide our brokenness, yes. right? How crazy would it be to go to the hospital and hide your injury? No, the first thing you do when you go to the hospital is say, here's exactly how I'm broken and I need the physician. And that's what this church is. That's what your small groups are for. Right. That's what this community is for around the world is to get together to see the great physician to go, here's exactly how I'm injured. I'm not gonna hide it anymore. I need you. I was hiding it. So embarrassed, um, so ashamed. And one day I was driving home from the dentist of all places and I started having a panic attack. And I had been having panic attacks for a while, but I knew somehow this one was just different. This is different. And, and those of you who have experienced this, you're gonna know exactly what I'm talking about. My mind all of a sudden started racing. Almost, it almost felt like a tornado was kicked up in my mind. And it instantly went to this like tightness in my chest and I started to feel like I couldn't breathe and I started to feel like I was suffocating and then I started shaking and, 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 and sweating and my, my blood pressure is going through the roof and, and I started feeling super claustrophobic and anytime I would have a panic attack, I would feel real claustrophobic and I'm just like freaking out. It felt like I'm gonna die. And, and all I wanted to do was get out. I needed to get out of my truck, but I didn't know where to go. I, I couldn't like figure it out in my mind. And I, I passed the school and I was like, I can't go there. The kids will come out and I can't go to my office because I can't let the staff see me like this. And I can't go to our house because our house is surrounded by people who have Red Rocks Church stickers on their car windows and they can't see me like this. And like, I didn't know where to go. And, and I was driving down the highway in Denver next to these foothills and I just pulled my car over to the side of the road and I was crying and I called my wife, Jill, and I said, babe, please pray. And she knew the second she heard my voice, what was going on. She said, honey, can you make it home? I said, I don't think I can. And then I hung up. In retrospect, not the best way to handle that situation for Jill's sake. <laughs> Through the phone in the, in the truck and I just start walking around and I start walking up these foothills next to a highway feeling like I'm absolutely losing my mind and I'm crying and I'm shaking and I'm yelling, I'm yelling uh, to the world, I'm yelling at myself, I'm yelling at God, I'm begging. I remember saying, I need a miracle, I need a miracle. I can't live this way, I can't live this way anymore. I can't hide this anymore, just, just broken. What's crazy is, is on paper, I should be one of the happy people. I have an incredible wife, like I'm married way up. I have an incredible wife, three amazing boys. I get to be a part of a great church. Like I should, be, I should be one of the happy ones. Isn't it interesting how we can look a certain way on the outside to everybody around us and be dying on the inside? And then we feel embarrassed and shameful about how we are hurting on the inside. So now I gotta hide it and make it worse. That's where I was at. And my, my wife, she knew where I was coming from. And so she and a couple friends, they ended up finding me on the side of this hill next to a highway. And I don't know how long I'd been there. And I remember the first thing I said to him, I just said, I, I quit. I can't do this anymore. I can't, I can't be a pastor. I can't take the pressure. And then I just said, I'm sorry. I just kept saying, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Cause, cause when you deal with this stuff, you feel ashamed because you deal with it. You feel bad for the people around you because you deal with it. It's so real. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. And so after that day, I knew like things have to change. I can't pretend anymore. I can't hide this anymore. I ended up checking myself into seven weeks of an inpatient anti-anxiety counseling center where six days a week, I went through therapy and, and, and counseling and pastoral care and physical care and uh, all kinds of, uh, I would spend two hours of every single day in a class just learning how to practically deal with panic attacks and anxiety and depression. And so it was seven weeks and I took several months off work and it started this journey that I never expected to go on, quite honestly, where I feel like God has shown me truckloads of information, just downloaded truckloads of stuff to me to, to, to be able to, to not just deal with depression and not just get attacked by anxiety, but to actually start to fight back and to actually start to experience some freedom that his son died to provide us with, right? 
And, and so it, it's, it's absolutely my honor to get to talk to you out of this book today, Attacking Anxiety. And what, what we're going to do is, is just, we're just going to scratch the surface today. Um, but if you decide that this would be good for you or a loved one, I want you to know something uh, because I don't want you to miss this. One of my favorite parts of this entire thing is the appendix. It's not even one of the chapters. I have an appendix in here and it's called Panic Attack Survival Guide. And I'm gonna give you five things to practically do in the middle of having a panic attack. And then I'm gonna give you five things to practically do to help a loved one as they're going through a panic attack. And it's stuff that would have been priceless to me three years ago. And so I hope it's a blessing to you. And I'm honored to get to talk to you from this today. Um, three, today's gonna be three things that I have learned through this journey about anxiety and depression. The first thing is this, we can fight back. I didn't know that. I really didn't. It sounds simple, but I felt like this is just how I'm wired. It's how I was created. It's who I am. I have to just deal with it. I just wait for the next panic attack and try to survive it. I'll just wait for the next three days worth of depression and try to survive it. There's nothing I can do. That's how I felt. And as I started studying and, just, and, and, and getting into this, I started to realize, no, we don't have to just take this stuff. We can fight back. Yeah. Well, one of the best conversations I, I ever had in this whole journey was, it was right at the beginning and I was sitting down at a table with a pastor and I was telling him about all my anxiety and all my depression and complaining about my past. And I remember crying. And I was like, I think I'm about to have a panic attack while I'm telling you about my panic attacks. Like I was a hot mess. And what I thought is like, he's such a nice pastor. And what I thought is, is he was going to actually get up and like probably come around the side of the table and you give me one of these, you know, oh, and maybe some soothing back circles, you know what I mean? Like, I, you were, we're okay. I definitely expected a hug, Levi. Sure, I mean, yeah. That's what I, I got no hugs. I'm, I'm crying, I'm telling him all my stuff, I can't stop him, da, 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 And he looked at me, and I've never forgotten this, and it's what got me started on this journey. He said, listen to me, it is time you stopped blaming yourself, and it's time you started fighting back. It's time you stopped blaming yourself, and it's time you started to fight the enemy. There is a fighter inside of you. Yes, you can. Fresh Life, I want to be the one to tell you today, there's a fighter spirit hardwired inside of you by your creator, and you don't have to just take this anymore. You can take a stand. You can fight back, and you can begin to experience peace and joy and freedom on levels you don't think are possible. We can fight back. When he said that, I got real fired up on the inside, but I didn't really know what it meant. And so for me, I just started really, as, as I'm in counseling and therapy and studying the word, I'm like, what does this mean? And what I realized is, is I hadn't seen this before, but there's many times throughout the Bible where God actually says, I have something for you. I have a new level. I have a new level of influence. I have a new experience. I have a better life. I have something here I want to give you. And then he says this, now go fight to take hold of it. I got something for you, son. I got something for you, daughter. Now fight to take hold of it. Yeah. I'm gonna give you, I'll give you one Old Testament and one New Testament example, and then we're gonna roll. Joshua 1.3. If you've been in church for a minute, you'll be familiar with this story. If you haven't, let me give you some quick context. The nation of Israel, they were, they were enslaved in Egypt for about 400 years and God sends Moses and Moses goes and you guys maybe, maybe saw the movie and uh, he's asked to let him go and he says no and there's 10 plagues and he finally says, okay, enough's enough and he lets him go. They, the, the nation of Israel leaves Egypt. They get stuck at the, at the Red Sea. God miraculously parts the Red Sea. The whole nation of Israel goes through. He closes it back up. Now the nation of Israel is free from Egypt on their way to something that the Bible calls the promised land. Moses dies and, and Joshua is put in charge. Scared to death, brand new position, brand new calling, being called to do something that feels impossible. He's been being called to take these people across the Jordan River at flood time. It can't happen. Like everything in life is new. And he just spent a month crying over the loss of his friend and leader. So he's a mess. God comes to him and he says this, I will give you every place where you set your foot as I was, as I promised Moses. And he, and he talks to him about going to get this promised land. And he says, when you put your foot in this city, I'm going to give it to you. And when you put your foot in this city, I'm going to give it to you. And when you put your foot in this city, I'm going to give it to you. I've, I'm going to give you the promised land. If I'm Joshua, that's pretty exciting news, right? What's interesting is seven, six verses later, this, there's this verse that we put on coffee mugs and t-shirts and get tattoos of 
But we rarely think about how freaked out Joshua would have been when he heard it. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Wait a minute. You just, what was all that put my foot place talk? You just said every place I put my foot, you're gonna give me. If you're gonna give me this stuff, why would I be afraid? Why would I get discouraged? Why do I need to have all this courage? See, because what we now know that he didn't know at the time is God said, I'm gonna give you the promised land, but you're gonna have to go fight 31 battles to take hold of it. Son, I have something for you. Daughter, I have something for you. I got a whole new life for you. Now stand up on the inside and fight and go take hold of what I have ready for you. 2 Timothy 4, 7, this is the apostle Paul, one of the most influential humans to have ever lived. And he's talking to his protege. And, and he says this, he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. He says, Timothy, you know, you, you, you've watched me live. And I've lived with this unbelievable purpose on my life, unbelievable destiny. God has used me to do crazy things. I've, I've experienced his peace and his joy and his confidence in the middle of some of life's craziest situations. I have walked in my calling. He says, but make no mistake about it. It was a fight. He said, that's what he's telling Timothy. If you want to walk in your calling, if you want to experience the things God has for you, if you want to experience the new levels where God wants to take you, it's going to be a fight. But I love that he says, it's a good fight. It's worth it. You're worth it. Your freedom's worth it. Your family's freedom is worth it. This fight is worth it. So I want you to start to get something on the inside that says, yes, I can. Yes, I can. Now, when this pastor told me this, I, I, I did. I started to get a little fired up. About a nanosecond later, my next thought, Levi, was, I don't have the energy. I'm exhausted. I've been having panic attacks every day now for a few weeks. If I knew how to fight, I already would have. I'm exhausted. I don't know what to do. And I know that a bunch of you know what that feels like. And here's what we need to understand as we, as we start talking about that we can fight back. I want you to know this. This fight is not about our strength. This fight is about our God's strength. This fight is not about our strength. It's not about me getting strong enough to pull myself up by my bootstraps and power my way through this. This one's not about my strength. This one's about my God's strength. Ephesians 3.20 says this, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. I love that verse because it reminds me God wants to do things in our lives that we can't even imagine possible. And when you're really dealing with anxiety and when you're really dealing with depression, put your, if, if, there, there are days when if you put me on a polygraph test, I would have to, had to admit, I don't see a better future in store. I can't imagine being set free from this stuff. I can't imagine living a better life. And God says, I got something in store for you that you can't imagine. And it's not gonna be by your power. It's gonna be by my power. So son, daughter, let's go. I grew up in, in Kansas, um, out in the country, and so just that deserves counseling. <laughs> I also rode the bus to school. Any, any of you guys out there bus, bus, bus people? See, we've been through things that non-bus people don't ever understand. We need counseling on a whole different level. There's a whole world that happens on bus rides to and from school that, 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 the, that the parent driver kids, they don't know. So, so I was about third grade. We had assigned seats on this bus. And uh, I was sitting next to a high schooler. Um, we'll call him Jeff. Jeff. Jeff was a bully, all right? I don't know what was happening with Jeff's home life, but for some reason, it made him feel good to pick on this, me, this little third grader. He would do these things where he'd slide over the seat and I'd fall out into the aisle and then he'd laugh. He'd punch me in the shoulder. He'd punch me in the leg. He did the pencil eraser test. This is, this is only bus kids know this stuff. You take a pencil eraser and they would rub it back and forth on your arm. And he would say, don't you tell me to quit. Don't you tell me to quit. You better keep going. And it, it tore all the skin off my arm. I had a scar for about 10 years. I was thinking about this message this week. And I'm like, I'd fight Jeff today if I could find him. I'll be honest. <laughs> I'll fight Jeff today. Um, 
One day I came, I got on the bus and I had, I had like, a, like a whole semester's worth of papers and, and homework and the, the teacher had graded them and I'm holding this stack of papers and Jeff takes out a Sharpie marker and he starts writing cuss words across my papers. And the, the big bad one was on the top, right? So I get home and my dad sees the papers. My dad was a very no-nonsense, handle-your-business kind of guy. And he sees the papers and he goes, what's this? And I was like, ah, just this thing that I've been dealing with. And um, I know you, you always tell me to handle my business and, and, and I, I haven't been able to figure out how to do this one on my own. And so I, I don't want to tell you because I've been kind of embarrassed. It's kind of how we feel about our anxiety. I didn't want to tell you because I feel like I should be strong enough to handle it myself. And because I can't, I'm really embarrassed and I feel ashamed. And that's why I haven't told you yet. He said, who did this? I said, Jeff. He goes, Jeff down the street, Jeff. I went, yeah. He goes, get in the car. I'm like, no, 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 dad, no, please, no. You're going to make it worse. You don't understand. Oh, please, please, you don't, you don't have to ride the bus tomorrow. I do. Can we please not go to Jeff's house? My dad goes, get in the car. I get in the car. We drive to Jeff's. We pull up right next to the house, right next to the front door. I hear everything that's about to transpire because, of course, we had to drive with the windows down because, God forbid, we waste gas on air conditioning. And so I'm sitting in the car, and my dad goes up to the door, and there's no, like, No, it's a boom, 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 boom. And I'm just like, oh my gosh. I could tell by the knock, like we're in trouble. <laughs> Jeff's dad comes to the door. Keep in mind, he has no idea what's happening. And unfortunately for him, he was a little guy. <laughs> my dad was not. He comes to the door, no, hi, how are you? No, hey, I'm Mr. Johnson. And seems like the kids have a little issue. Maybe we could discuss none of that. Comes to the door, my dad holds up the papers with the F word written across the front of it. And he goes, you see this? Keep in, just dad doesn't even know what's going on. He's like, uh-huh. He goes, your boy ever touches my boy again, I'll be back here and I'm taking care of you. We clear? Jeff's dad goes, we clear. He takes the papers and goes, boom, throws them in his face. They, it's a movie scene is what's happening right now. The papers are all falling down. My dad, one more time, he goes, I'm gonna ask you one more time. We clear? We clear? My dad goes, comes and gets in the car with me, looks at me and goes, it's handled. And we drove home and we've never talked about it again my whole life. Hey, Fresh Life, you should have seen the swagger I had on the bus the next day. I was walking on that bus like, what's up now? I got over to my seat and I'm like, what's up, Jeff? Jeff slides all the way over to the window. He just looks out the window, doesn't say, dude didn't say a word to me the rest of, of his high school career. That's it. Wow. Listen, all my dad wanted from me was to be willing to get in the car and go to the battlefield. Because what he knew is, is when we arrive over here, this has nothing to do with your strength and everything to do with my strength. All, I believe all God wants us to do is say, say, I'm willing to fight. I'm willing to say, yes, God, let's fight. I don't have to take it anymore. I'll just get in the car. And God says, that's all I need, son. That's all I need, daughter. Just be willing to get in the car. Let's go to the battlefield, because when we get there, this is about my strength, not yours. I got this. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you the victory. We can fight back. It's not about our strength. Thank God. It's about his. Second thing I learned is this, there is a spiritual battle to be fought. There's a spiritual battle to be fought here. I was ignoring that. Kind of embarrassed to tell you that as a pastor, but I just was. I was ignoring the fact that, in fact, I was, I was, in, I was in counseling at that, in that seven week inpatient place and I was having a panic attack in a counseling session. Like you're a hot mess when you're at anti-anxiety counseling and then you're, you know what I mean? So, and I'm trying to, muscle my way through it. And I remember I was gritting my teeth and I'm clenching my fists and I'm trying to fight off this anxiety attack. My counselor said, hey, Sean, trying to fight off a panic attack like that, it's kind of like 
being stuck in a gigantic hole and you go, oh my gosh, I'm in a hole and you got a shovel, you go, oh my gosh, I'm in a hole, I better dig faster. He said, this isn't just physical. He said, there's, there's a spiritual battle taking place here. There's a spiritual battle to be fought. Here's what he told me. You're not just fighting anxiety. You're not just fighting depression. You're also fighting the enemy. John 10.10 10 explains it, right? He says, the thief comes only to kill and steal and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus said, I have, I have the best possible life in store for you. And, and Satan, who's not gonna create anything, he's just gonna try to take part of what God has given us and twist those things and flip those things around and skew those things and begin to try to hurt us with some of the very gifts that God has given us. That's what's happening with this anxiety stuff. And I didn't realize it because I was telling my counselor, I just want all the anxiety to go away. And he said, the craziest thing, Levi, he goes, no, you don't. Yeah, wow. I said, what? Yes, I do. He said, no, no, no. There's a good God-given healthy fear that God has given you and it's a gift. He called it facilitating anxiety. He said, you don't want to lose that. It's what keeps you from driving 120 miles per hour on the side of the road, on the side of a cliff with no guardrail. It keeps you safe. I, I live in Littleton, Colorado, and when we go on walks behind our neighborhood, there's, there's places up there where there's rattlesnakes. So I have this good God-given healthy fear, this facilitating anxiety that I get out in front of the family and I'm checking things out and I'm kind of on edge and I'm kind of ready to react because I'm gonna make sure I'm trying to keep my, my family safe. That's a gift from God. Wow. It's not just about our, our protection. It's also, it helps us perform at our best. It helps us do some of the things that God's called us to do. It, it, it's like a batter stepping into the batter's box, right? You, you want those jitters. You want your body to be on high alert. You want everything ready to go. It's like before you make that big sale, before you have a tough conversation, before you take a test, it's what I felt sitting down here in worship right before I got up here. I want to be all amped up. I want to perform at my best. This is a God-given gift facilitating anxiety. I don't want to lose that. Neither do you. Yeah. So what happens is, is Satan twists it and, and then it turns into debilitating anxiety. And that's when this God-given thing now becomes something that is harming your life. And now it's gotten so bad. I can't live my life normally. I can't walk in the calling that God has for me. It's not just physical. It is a spiritual battle as well. Now make no mistake about it. There are many practical things that needed to happen for me in that, in that seven week period. That was just the beginning. I needed counseling. I, I needed childhood trauma therapy. I needed someone to look at my medications. I needed to learn how to forgive some people. I needed to figure out how to get past some past hurts in my life. Like I needed, but the thing I was avoiding the most was the spiritual aspect. And so sometimes we forget that, right? Because we just want to get practical and fix it. And we forget that this is a spiritual battle. Listen to this, Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God. Why do we put on the full armor of God? Because he, he has put a fighter spirit inside of you, every single one of you. And he says, now every now and then it's gonna be time to armor up and go to war. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. See, we're not, we're not just fighting anxiety. We're also fighting the enemy. There's a spiritual battle. And I believe the spiritual battle, I believe this battle starts in the presence of our God. I was sitting at this table with this pastor, and he reminded me that I was a fighter, and he told me that I didn't have to take it and that I could actually do something about it. And he says, we're gonna, we're gonna start fighting. And I'm so, I was so embarrassed to say this because I am a pastor. I, I do this for a living. And I sat at this table, tears streaming down my face. And I said, I don't even know where to start. I teach people how to do this as a profession. But I'm so overwhelmed. I'm so scared. I'm so shamed. I'm so beside myself, I don't even know where to start. Here's what he said. He said, we're gonna pray and we're going to worship and we're going to war. We're going to pray, we're going to worship and we're going to war. Honestly, my first thought was, that's all you got? I've done those two things. He said, not like this, you haven't. No longer is, no longer is prayer gonna be this 
10 second thing before you eat and worship as part of the church service. No, no, no. These are God given spiritual weapons and we are flat out going to war. He said, here's the, here's the ground rules. Handed me a Bluetooth speaker. I was in this inner city for two weeks. He said, there's a room over there in the church that nobody's using for the next two weeks. I want you and your wife to go in there for 30 minutes every day. Here's the rules. Whatever volume you put the music at, I want you and your wife to pray together out loud at that volume together. We're going to war. We're going to pray. We're going to worship. We're going to war. Now, when he said this, my wife was really excited. <laughs> I was less than really excited. And, and I know it sounds horrible and not very spiritual, but... I don't really like praying out loud with people for long periods of time. Um, number one, I'm not very eloquent. And like my wife's one of those people uh, that, you know, she quotes like three verses in every prayer. You know, you ever been around those people? And like they say amen and you're like, oh my gosh, that was amazing. And then it's my turn. I'm like, uh, hey God, I, uh, things kind of suck today. So I'm like, I don't want her to hear me pray. And I, I don't know that I want her to hear everything I need to pray about. And if I'm fully honest, I want God's attention to myself. He said, 30 minutes, you're gonna pray together. You're gonna go to war. Now, um, I wanna end this message in, a, in what's gonna sound weird at first. I wanna end this message by telling you how hard it was. Because see, what, what, what I do and what some of my friends do and, and, and nothing but pure motives is, is we share biblical principles and then we go like this. Now go get them, kid. Get out there and put them to use. So the problem is if, if, if all I do is tell you to go get in the presence of God and start fighting this thing, my, my, my fear is, is that you'll try it once or twice and you won't feel anything immediately and you'll feel kind of stupid doing it and then you'll stop and you'll miss out on what God has for you. I wanna tell you how hard it was but how worthwhile it was. We went to this prayer room and uh, put on the music and my wife started to pray out loud and there was a couch in this room and I sat on the couch for 30 minutes and cried. Day one was over, that was it. I didn't have anything in me. Came back day two, my wife's walking around the room praying out loud I sat on the couch and I remember the only thing I knew to say was, Jesus, help me. Jesus, help me. I was so desperate. I didn't have the strength. Jesus, help me. Day two was over and we left. I didn't feel any different. But I came back for day three. And what I learned through this process is it was the coming back into his presence that was important, not how I felt during the process. Wow. Wow. So I come back day three and we started, I, I've made a playlist for this, this little prayer room. And the first two songs were Sea of Victory by Elevation Worship and Breakthrough by Red Rocks Worship. And so every day I start my prayer time with these two songs. And I remember on day three, I went and stood next to a window. And if I was an artist, I could paint a picture of what I saw out that window because I stared at it for so many days in a row. And I stared out that window and I would just listen to the song and I just let it wash over me. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. Day three was over and we left and I didn't feel that different. Day four, we came back. I remember day four, I started walking around a little bit with my hands in my pockets. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. God, God, please, I'm gonna see a victory. By the end of the two weeks, I'm walking around this room like this. I had some pep to my step. I'm gonna see a victory in the name of Jesus. I got, the, I got the same spirit that brought him up out of the grave inside me today. Greater is he who is within me than he that is in the world. No weapon formed against me is gonna prosper. I'm gonna see a victory. And I was, I was passionately praying and worshiping. It took me two weeks to get there. When we left, I wasn't having panic attacks on a daily basis anymore. I had already started to experience some freedom on levels that I didn't even think I was gonna get to that. Why? Would you put that last graphic up? Take a screenshot of this if you would. If you're on a phone, on a computer, if you're in a building, grab your phone and just take a screenshot of this. I want you to have some, some artillery as you go to war this week. These are seven promises 
God says, this is what happens when you get into my presence. There is peace in my presence. There is joy in my presence. There is rest in my presence. Just think about this for some of you and some of your loved ones. If, if I could get some peace and some joy and some rest, it would change my life right now. If your loved one could get some peace and some joy and some rest, it could change their life right now. He says, I promise you, if you get into my presence, this is the byproduct. There's peace in my presence. There's joy. There's rest. There's confidence. There's guidance. There's protection. There's power. Yes, you can. You can fight. It's a spiritual battle, but he's going to, in, in order to rely on my strength, you got to get into my presence and let me start to flex for you. And that's seven promises. He said, this is what's going to happen when you do. Nowhere near perfect. There's still times when I battle. But I can tell you with all sincerity, I'm, I'm better and I'm healthier and I'm stronger than I ever thought I could be. And that's what I want for you. And that's what I want for your loved ones. And I'm telling you, God has hardwired a fighter spirit inside of you. Some of you just need to tap into it today and say, okay, I don't have much strength, but I'll get in the car. I'll go to the battlefield. And God, I, I need you to fight for me because I don't have what it takes to fight for myself, but I'll get into your presence and start leaning on your strength because I do know that you are the God of hope and peace and joy and hope is what you have in store for me and my loved ones. And I'm gonna start to fight back in Jesus' name. And everybody said, let me pray for you. God, I, I thank you so much that you're with us right now. I thank you for your son. I thank you that your son died on a cross to pay the price for our sins. And without even ever deserving it, we can accept this free gift of salvation today. I thank you for that. I thank you that you care about us. I thank you that you're with us. I thank you that your word promises that you'll never leave us and you'll never forsake us. And that you're with us and you're working even on the days we can't see it and feel it. I thank you for the Holy Spirit you've given us. I thank you for these spiritual weapons you've given us. And God, I pray for every single person watching that they would begin to be experience some peace and some joy and some hope on new levels. In fact, if you're in a building with everyone's eyes closed, I wanna ask a couple questions. I wanna give you a chance to respond to what God might be saying to you today. And if, if you're watching online, you just respond in your own way, wherever you're at. The first question is this, either me or someone I care about, this is their reality. Anxiety and depression, hopelessness, at times even suicidal thoughts, it's a reality for me or someone I care about. And today I wanna just say, God, I need a miracle. I wanna start fighting and I need your strength to do it. If that's you right now, just raise your hand at all the locations. We're just gonna pray together and believe that, God, that this is the beginning. This is a milestone. We're gonna look back on today and we're gonna go, oh my gosh, look what God has done. The second question I have for you is this. I've talked a lot about leaning on our God in the middle of this battle. And as I'm talking about that, what you're thinking is, I don't even have a relationship with this God. But you can feel something's happened in your heart today and you go, I think today's my day. I need to start a relationship with him. I need to ask for forgiveness of my sins. I need to ask for him to, to come into my life and I'm not gonna be perfect and I don't have a clue how this is gonna turn out. It's my time. I can feel it in my heart. He's calling me. I want forgiveness of my sins and I want to try to follow him because I want his spirit to live within me, inside of me for the rest of my life. I need his spirit to be able to help get me through things I can't get through on my own. And I want heaven forever. And I know that he's made that available to me and I can just feel it in my heart. Today is the day I need to say yes to Jesus. If that's you right now at every location, just shoot your hand up. I need to say yes to Jesus. This is my day. This is it. Yes, yes. Thank you, God. I thank you, God, for the life that are being changed literally around the world right now. I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your peace. I thank you for your joy. I thank you for your son.